Good evening, everyone. Um, as Simon said, my name is Olaf Berg, and I'm employed by Sunland Private Wealth as an analyst. In the presentation this evening, I'll be discussing long-term investing as an investment strategy, as an investment philosophy, um, and why we at Sunland Private Wealth employ a value bias when we construct our portfolios. There's a fair bit to get through, so I'm going to go quite quickly at times. Firstly, the analogy I use is that of favorably loading your dice in terms of your, our investments. Um, investing encompasses the future. It's all about the future, and, and in so, it's, about, it's uncertain. It's not a, a, a perfect science. It's not a perfect maths. Um, and the best we can do is try and employ a strategy which allows us to make more correct decisions than incorrect decisions and more decisions which are incorrect, which don't cost us less. Or let's phrase it differently. The decisions we make which are incorrect, uh, we don't want us to cost um, a lot. And on the contrary, when we make right decisions, we want those decisions to benefit us greatly. Um, we, how we go about this is essentially buying companies, you know, in, in the typical value uh, philosophy, we try and buy companies below their so-called intrinsic value, which means we buy companies below a value which we deem to be their fair value. Um, that essentially means that we generally try and price in the assumptions that the market's making when it values any given company and then determine whether those assumptions are reasonable or overly optimistic, which would mean the price would be too high, or overly pessimistic, which would result in the price being too low. Obviously, we are interested in companies where we deem the market to be overly pessimistic on the future expectations for the company, and hence the price is too low. That's when we start getting interested and, and start taking positions. Just in terms of the agenda for the evening, firstly, I'll discuss some perspectives on the SA wealth market. Um, there's some quite interesting tidbits there. We'll then move on to value investing as an investment philosophy. We'll discuss why value investing, we believe, is the best investment strategy. Um, we'll provide some statistical support and some anecdotal evidence why we believe it's, it's, the, it's the strategy to employ. We will then go on a little bit of a tangent and speak to quality and the notion of quality. Uh, and we'll conclude with our SPW's investment philosophy, that's Sunland Private Wealth's investment philosophy, um, a conclusion, and then a look at our performance over the, the years which we've been in existence. So moving on to perspectives. Um, I think it's probably important to note that everyone who is in the active asset management game is trying to achieve the same thing, which is outperform their benchmarks, which generally speaking are either their peer groups or the indexes. So firstly, you've got to believe that the market is inefficient in its nature, meaning that mispricing opportunities exist for you to exploit as active, active asset manager. Uh, and then secondly, you've got to believe that you can do so better than the other players trying to do the same thing. Because it's, of course, a mathematical certainty that only 50% of assets by value can beat the peer group benchmarks or the indexes, which is essentially the same thing, um, be, before costs. After costs, it's a mathematical certainty that less than 50% of the actively managed funds will beat their peer groups, benchmarks. So is that why you call them assets? <laughs> <laughs> well picked up. <laughs> You're not asleep yet. Uh, a second point to make is that the bulk of the assets, and I'll get to a graph demonstrating that a bit later, are managed by massive teams who are highly educated, highly professional, um, highly motivated, and, uh, and hardworking. Um, so it's not the easiest of tasks being able to beat your peers and beat the indexes. And then lastly, it is a crowded trade. Just within the general equity space, and that's only one of numerous categories, there are 246 general equity unit trusts and only 370 listed shares to choose from. So those are just some interesting um, facts to, to, to set the scene. Having a look at the overall industry, it's a 5.9 trillion rand industry with the institutional money or institutional asset managers, and those are largely the pension funds and retirement annuities and the like, uh, comprising 50% of the overall funds. 
the retail asset managers, which is the unit trust, the typical Allen Grays and Coronations, um, comprise 17%. The PIC, which is man uh, managing the public um, institution's money, comprises 20%. And then the remaining 13% is managed by private wealth asset managers like ourselves. If you take, um, if you take these two segments of the pie and you break it up further in terms of the asset managers, you find that 61% is managed by the top big, the top six biggest asset managers in the country, um, which when viewed uh, relative to the overall pie means that the top six biggest asset managers manage 41% of the assets in this country. And then if you add the PIC to that as asset manager, the top seven manage 61% of the assets in this country. So uh, it's, uh, the, the wealth industry is quite concentrated amongst the big names in, in this country, even though there are numerous other players in the game. Lastly, just in terms of um, the favored choices with regards to which assets uh, asset, um, or portfolios mandates people sign, you'd see that the majority of assets are run according to a balanced mandate, um, around 40%. A further 25% are managed according to a to equity only mandate, and then the remainder is, is made up um, largely of fixed, uh, fixed income type um, mandates. So moving on to value investing, which is essentially the crux of this presentation. Value investing is premised, as I mentioned earlier, on buying assets below their intrinsic values and then holding onto those assets as they migrate towards their intrinsic values. That's the simple theory around any value investing. Unfortunately, although it sounds simple, it's not as simple as what it sounds. Firstly, it's not simply a matter of historical simple valuations uh, like the common price to equity or price or dividend yield that we like to look at, but rather a matter of normalized valuations, which is a valuation based on the through the cycle or the normalized earnings potential of a company. And then often it takes a long time. Markets can um, be, call it inefficient if you like, or possibly just behind your view for sometimes significant periods of time, which could result in currently the, the value players are experiencing this, could result in significant periods of underperformance, which not only costs in terms of relative performance, but certainly costs in terms of um, assets under management, which drops to the bottom line for asset managers, which means they make um, less rands and cents. So it's um, it can be painful at times, but those who've stuck to their guns have generally reaped the rewards. Um, as I mentioned earlier as well, generally we find that the opportunities arise in uh, for value investors when the market generally uh, misprices or underappreciates the long-term growth prospects of any given asset. So generally when the outlook is dim and more dim that we've, th than what we feel is justified, um, with regard to a certain asset, we find that the opportunity is there to, to, to invest at a low price and in so doing probably and hopefully generate good performance, which is what obviously what the game's about. We all want to generate the best performance possible. This is a very, very interesting question, and that is why do shares deviate from their fair value? Um, some profes uh, professionals and professors and academics believe that the market is by and large very efficient and that there isn't any benefit to be had by taking an active stance and hence the growth of the whole, the whole passive industry, um, the ETFs and, and the like, the satrixes uh, of this world. If you believe in active management, you've got to believe that there are some inefficiencies in the market and you've got to believe that you're able to exploit those inefficiencies. So what lead to these inefficiencies? Because obviously no one wants to be inefficient. No one wants to be the stupid person who's buying high and the stupid person who's selling at the bottom. It's not, um, it's not within their interest and no one enjoys losing money. And largely the, the reasons for this are firstly emotions and then some hardwired irrational behavioral biases or traits which all humans exhibit. And I just touched on a couple here and I'm not going to speak to them in depth. I mean, this is... Um, this is a presentation in itself, but you get uh, biases like heuristic-driven biases, which is essentially rules of thumb. You get frame dependence like loss aversion and money illusion. Essentially, people don't like losing, so they hold on to their winners. Uh, fear and greed is very well documented. Um, uh, it's essentially 
half the ads on TV, I think, are, are from asset managers, and, and at least 75% of those uh, play on the fear and greed um, aspect of, of asset management. The crux of it is that these biases and emotions result in humans making irrational decisions at times, which results in some inefficiencies, which if you play it right, you're able to exploit. And hence, some players consistently deliver better performance than the market. Generally, they result in the market, these, these, these um, biases generally result in the market becoming more focused on the short term. And a term we use, use is we say that ex the market extrapolates the short term into perpetuity. So the market takes what's happening right now and says, well, this is an indication of what a particular share or industry or sector can and will do forever. And generally, we find that is the reason where or that is where the opportunities lie because we believe in cycles and industries and companies go through cycles um, because of simple economic factors. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples just explaining the extrapolation of the short-term operating environment concept to you. I mean, these, fact, these, these, these examples are, are very commonplace and, and very obviously pre prevalent as well. Firstly, let's just look at this graph and explain it. Um, the red line is the operating profit margin. So it's the profitability of, in this case, Murray and Roberts. Um, we know Murray and Roberts is a construction company. It's been through numerous, it's been through tough times of late. It's had significant share price depreciation, but there was a time when Murray and Roberts was the absolute market darling. Um, so there was a time when it generated very good profits and increasing levels of profitability measured um, by the operating profit margin. The blue line is the consensus target price. And I'm going to have a, a dig at my own ilk here in that um, the blue line is essentially the average analyst's price for, for stock. And you'd see in this case that the average analyst's expectation for the t uh, price of the stock moved pretty much where the, the stock uh, moved itself. So they weren't adding much value and they certainly weren't have taking a a decent view of, of the long-term earnings potential of the company. And then the, the green line is simply the price. And what this graph tells you is that when the times are good, and we look now in the middle of this graph, um, when the profitability is good, the market says, right, this is fantastic. The company is doing well. It's making great profits. And we expect that to continue for a long period of time. This was a unique environment in that um, there was a lot of construction build happening um, firstly, with regard um, to the commodities boom and the civil and other work related to the mines. And then secondly, um, relating to the Soccer World Cup, where we had to build a lot of roads, a lot of stadium, which sucked up supply and, and pushed the pricing power in the hands of the construction companies, essentially allowed them to price well and attain this increase, these increasing margins. So the market at this point said, fantastic, this is great. We're going to price these companies as if this will continue. Um, and at that point in time, the stock price um, on an intraday level actually touched um, 100 Rand. Marion Roberts is now at 10 Rand. This graph is a little bit outdated and it's fallen. So it's 90% down from where it was, essentially the same company. Uh, the market was way too optimistic here, yeah, potentially, and we believe it to be the case that the market is way too pessimistic on Marion Roberts at the moment. Um, these are the examples where, where we find opportunities. Moving on, the same concept, just a different company. We're now speaking about Astral, which is the poultry player. Again, it's a volatile industry. These volatile industries provide the best examples because they've got the most fluctuations in their profitability levels or their margins. Um, again, what we see here is that the share price and the share price movement essentially moves in lockstep with, um, with what the company's profits are doing. Uh, when the company's profits are high, the share price is appreciating quite nicely, and, and, and so are the, the analysts who essentially should be looking through that, um, or at least at least providing some kind of insights other than just being slightly above the share price. Um, and and the, 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 the same is true in, in, on the contrary. As soon as the profitability falls, the market expects it to continue, and the share price um, follows suit. Um, theoretically, um, if, if, if all expectations are priced incorrectly, the stock share price would rise by the cost of capital in a straight line. 
Now, that's probably a little bit of a theoretical approach because things change, companies' dynamics change, and so forth. But there should certainly not be as much volatility as there is if there was, if, if the market was totally rational. My last example regarding the extrapolation of the short-term short operating environment is um, slightly different, and this time it, it involves Imperial, the, the logistics company. Um, now, we, this graph is different, so it needs explaining again. The operating profit margin is the same as last time, and it's obviously a measure of profitability of the company. And as you can see, Imperial demonstrated a fair bit of cyclicality, particularly in the period of the global financial crisis. The red line is the consensus stock rating. So it's, it's what the average analyst who gets measured is saying. And it's measured on a scale from uh, naught to five, naught being the most bearish, so then most negative, five being the most um, positive. And again, as you can see, the analysts simply followed the profitability of the company. And when the company was generating good profits, they said, fantastic. We expect this to continue, and they rated the company highly and gave it a good um, share price above where the share was trading. And when the company had a bit of a, a wobble, all of a sudden, analysts pulled scared. And instead of saying, well, maybe this is the time to buy because the market's pulled back, they said, whoa, 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 we're unsure about this. We're going to give this some time. And uh, they pulled back their rating as well. So all of these examples just demonstrate to us and hopefully to you as well that the market is not always efficient. It does not always see everything rationally and does provide these opportunities if you are patient enough and brave enough to take them when they do arise. So this we just did for fun, and you probably are going to have a, a bit of a, a giggle or laugh at this because it's um, a finger's pointing straight back at me as an analyst. But what we did, yeah, and, and just um, follow the reasoning because we've got a couple more back tests um, backtest graphs in, in the presentation a bit further on. What we did here was that we split the market into five, let's call them buckets. Um, in the first bucket, we put the shares which the market rated best, the analyst rated best, and the second bucket, we put the shares which the market rated second best, and so forth. So the fifth bucket is the, is the bucket which the market, or the analyst in this case, least liked. Um, so that would be quintile five would be the fifth bucket and quintile one would be the, the bucket which the analysts liked the most. Uh, we then invested these buckets and rebalanced them on a semi-annual basis. So twice a year we, we, we rebalanced these buckets and we started this test in 2003 because of data reasons not going back further than that. And what it shows is that the, the analysts generally get the poor stocks Right. The stocks which um, they believe are going to underperform actually do end up underperforming. But the stocks which they expect to outperform generally don't do well that well. They generally do around, around uh, average, a little bit better than average. The stocks that do best are the stocks in quintile four and quintile three. So the purple line in this graph and the green line, um, they're the stocks which are, are lukewarm. The analysts don't really have strong views about them. It's generally where you should be investing your money if, if this back test is reflective of a, a normal environment. So why value and why long term? I think I did provide some reasons, but we go into graphical illustrations as to why. Obviously, this is not science now. We just um, This is a little illustration to demonstrate what we try and achieve. It's quite a well-used illustration, but it does prove the point quite well. Um, the straight line is the so-called fair value of a company, and the oscillating blue line is the share price of a company. And what we do as active asset managers uh, who employ a value strategy is we try and buy companies when they're trading below the green line and sell them as they migrate up and touch the green line and sometimes possibly get a bit lucky and hold them till when they go past the green line, although, although no one professes to do that. Everyone says, no, we take them to fair value, and then we look for the next um, next opportunity. Um, the reason why this works is that if you buy something less than intrinsic value and you hold it to when it reaches intrinsic value, obviously the gradient of your line is going to be steeper. So the, 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 the slope or the change in the share price is going to be more meaningful, more magnified, should you buy a share below intrinsic value and hold it to when it touches intrinsic value. 
the two important things are, of course, that your determination of intrinsic value is, is fair and accurate, and that um, and that you you don't see something or, or miss something which um, is justifiably results in the share price being well below its intrinsic uh, or your perceived idea of its intrinsic value. All these examples, you'd see that the red lines rise at a faster rate than what the green line rises. And if you can do this for all your companies within your portfolio, you're going to get a slope, which is a, a steeper slope, a steeper gradient, which means that your share price is changing quicker, which means you're generating better returns. And that's through illustration what we try and achieve uh, by employing the value strategy. As opposed to the momentum strategy, where the momentum guys don't really care where the share is trading relative to the green line, they just care if the share is going up or not. But why long term? You know, this 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 looks simple. You just have to buy a company when it's there or there or there or there, because you know that they're generally it's going to trade trade back to intrinsic value. So why long term? And long term is because companies don't always Sorry, cycles aren't exactly repeating. They don't follow the exact same pattern time after time. And often you might feel as though the cycle is um, at its worst. But sometimes, for example, in construction now, the depth and duration of this down cycle is, is un, unrivaled or un, un, um, never been experienced before. And the same can probably be said about the commodity cycle. We've never, uh, as far as I know, at least experienced a commodity cycle, which is as deep as this one and as long in duration as this one. Uh, probably duration is debatable, uh, debatable, but in terms of the depth of the declines, probably um, the most ever. So, uh, so graphically, um, you can be wrong for a period of time. You can think you're buying a cheap asset, but the asset becomes cheaper and cheaper, and you start looking more and more um, like a fool because you've said that the asset is, um, is cheap, but it, it, obviously the market doesn't feel the same way. But with time, you... And if everything goes according to plan, you're proven right. And that's why we pursue the value strategy. But we also have to, in conjunction with pursuing the value strategy, we have to pursue a long-term strategy as well. You cannot pursue a short-term value strategy. The two don't go hand in hand. And now just moving on to theoretical value. And this is quite technical, um, but broadly taught in most business schools and most universities, and that is how do you determine the value of the company? And the crux of it is, is that the value of a company is the discounted, the sum of the discounted earning stream or cash flows of a company into perpetuity. Um, discounting by the cost of capital, but let's not get so technical. The point is that value accrues very slowly. It's not determined by your next year's earnings or the year after that. Value accrues over a significant period of time. And using normal assumptions for equities, we find that after five years, typically you, you as an investor have accrued 20% of your value. After 10 years, you've accrued about 36%. And after 15 years, you've accrued roughly 50% of the value of your investment. So that must tie up with the fact that you cannot value a company on its current earning stream, um, but rather what the through the cycle normalized earning stream is. So what this, the average earning stream of that company might be. So moving on to some statistical and anecdotal evidence as to why value works. And I have to introduce a couple of statistical measures, and I'm going to try and keep them very simple, and I wrote them down to keep them as simple as I could, so I'm going to just refer to my notes here. And, and uh, so the first measure I'm going to speak to is co uh, correlation, and in layman's terms, correlation is the statistical measure of how two variables move in relation to each other. It's measured between 1 and negative 1, where 1 is a situation where the variables move in exactly the same manner. So they're in absolute lockstep with one another. Uh, if one goes up by one, the other one goes up by one. The negative one is exactly the opposite. So if one was to go up by one, the other one would go down by one. That's the first concept. The second concept is R squared, which measures how well one variable explains the other variable. So you have 
independent and a dependent variable. Um, the fact of the matter is that these statistical measures are used in describing or, or determining whether there's any statistical significance be, behind relationships um, that might exist. Um, and what so so that's the, the the theory behind us. What we found in summary, and I'll demonstrate it through through following slides. What we found in summary is that value certainly matters when you invest in companies which demonstrate value, and you hold those companies. There's a inverse relationship, so they're neg negatively correlated, meaning that if you hold a company, we buy a company at a high valuation, you can expect low prospective returns. And if you buy a company at a low valuation, you can expect high prospective returns. The time horizon matters. Um, it's certainly both these statistical measures strengthen with the longer the time horizon is that you choose, and we'll speak to that. Um, and then lastly, perspective matters. And when I say perspective, um, in this case, I'm referring to trying to identify the company's value based on a normal earnings, uh, the normal earnings power of a company or, or any asset for that matter. Um, so for example, let's use a practical example. Um, Anglo-American might seem at the moment to be on a very high PE multiple and a very low dividend yield. But if you take its earnings power at, on a through the cycle basis, you might find, I'm not saying this is the case, but you might find that it actually can demonstrate, uh, can, can, and can deliver significantly higher earnings and significantly higher dividends as a consequence of the higher earnings. And if you base your valuations on those uh, earnings, you might find that the valuations are cheap. So perspective certainly matters as well and results in a strengthening of the two statistical measures that I spoke to. So I'm going to give you the numbers, but we won't dwell on them very long. Um, if you, uh, let's, just, let's just illustrate the point. The longer you go out, the stronger the relationship is, so the, the stronger the negative correlation is. We're dealing with correlations here. And if you use normalized PEs as opposed to current PEs, you also get a stronger negative correlation. You see that in each case, the correlation, except for that one, the correlation is stronger. Um, regression, it's the same story. The longer you are out, the stronger the one variable explains the other variable. And if you use normalized PEs, exactly the same, same story is true. So it tells us that value does work statistically and but that it works better if you enable it with, through time and with the passage of time to do its thing, to, to, to unlock the value, so to speak. Graphically, and again, I probably have to explain these, but graphically, I've got two graphs here which tell exactly the story. Firstly, I look at just very simplistic PEs. That's a current PE, so the PE right now. And then on the left-hand side, it's very small. I, small, I apologize for that. On the left-hand side, you're looking at 10-year perspective returns from that point in time. And you'll see that there's a very loose relationship between um, the one-year, so it's not a 10-year perspective return, it's a one-year perspective return and the current PEs. There's a very loose relationship um, and not very statistically significant relationship between the, um, the current um, buying price or current valuations and the prospective returns. But there is still a negative correlation, um, meaning that you don't want to be buying when it's high, as you can see, generally lowish returns. And when you buy when it's, the valuations are low, you generally get high returns. That's on the one side of the spectrum. If you move exactly to the other side of the spectrum and you take a long-term time horizon and you use better perspective, so you use a normalized PE, you get a way better fit and way better um, correlation and a way steeper gradient as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're using a normalized PE, we're using 10-year perspective returns, and we um, and you can see that the, the R squared has become uh, much larger, much more significant, and so has the, as the correlation. Again, it's statistical, but we're just backing up what we believe in through stats and through these, um, with these past three slides. 
This graph speaks to exactly what I spoke to, um, but just put in terms of a, a bar chart. Um, and what you can see on the x-axis is the PE ranges, and on the y-axis, and particularly the red graph, which is the average um, return for the periods, is the subsequent five-year price appreciation. And you will see pretty clearly that as the pre-E ranges increase, so the average perspective return decrease, pretty much without fail. Um, so statistically speaking, there's strong support for value. It just sometimes takes time. Anecdotal support, and to get anecdotal support in this instance, we just looked at um, South Africa's successful asset managers. And obviously, with carrying on with this theme of long term, we used it the 10 year, which is the longest available uh, standardized reporting measure um, to, to, to um, rank the asset managers in, in South Africa. An important or interesting, at least, um, takeaway is that over 10 years, five years, and three years, only three of the top 10, which managed, which ranked on 10 years, managed to be in the top 10 over 10 years, five years, and three years. So it's very tough to consistently outperform, and very few get that right, if any. Um, lots of them obviously have got good track records, but get their track rec records or get their performance in chunks. Um, that's also another characteristic of, of value investing. So we're going to delve into the individual managers just to touch on the way they value money and see what they place um, emphasis on in their philosophies. And we find many commonalities amongst the top asset managers. We start with the number one over 10 years, um, which was Ford in this instance. And they say buying at the right price, long term, and be patient. So you're speaking time, you're speaking time again, and you're speaking price, which is a reference to value. Prudential, prudent, uh, prudent value approach, so that's um, self-explanatory. Coronation, long-term valuation based, I mean, it couldn't be more to, to the point with uh, relating to this presentation. Abs ABSA mentioned valuation focused. RESCO asset managers, probably a smaller one and amongst the, this, the, this lot. They speak to value investing. Alan Gray, the, the, the behemoth in our asset management space, but actually been surpassed by coronation in terms of assets under management. Um, they speak to about share price being less than the intrinsic value, which is essentially what value investing entails. And also their slogan is long-term investing. So um, exactly the two aspects of our investment philosophy, which um, I highlight. Sunlum, our company, uh, but this is referring to Sunlum Investment Management, so it's the institutional asset manager. They speak about pragmatic value, and PSG Asset Management speaks about discount to the inherent intrinsic values. Again, the same theme. Lastly, Kahisu, the story is the same. They all, without fail, have employed a value approach, um, and of course, in doing so, have to have been long-term focused. And keep in mind that this is the top asset managers in the country on a 10-year view. So it's, it's not just a flash in the pan. This is the longest measurement period which we can look at um, without delving deep into um, individual company records. Okay, I'm quickly going to deviate from the presentation slightly to touch on quality because often quality is misunderstood and it's a reference to past share price performance when it shouldn't necessarily be so. So we find, particularly with our clients, but also rather broadly in the market, that quality, as I alluded to, um, when people speak about quality, they refer to companies whose share price has appreciated the most over any given five or, or year period or something along those lines, a sust any sustained period. Quality, in, in, in actual fact, is the ability to sustainably deliver high returns on capital, higher than your cost of capital, um, through time, and in so doing, grow the intrinsic value of your business or the NAV of your business. So we conducted some tests as to how, how well past winners have done um, into the future. And um, so, so the, the structure of this testing is exactly the same as the previous 
um, back test which we did. So we're looking at how the past winners over five years have performed subsequent to that. So in quintile one, we put the shares which have performed best over the past uh, the preceding um, five years. And quintile two, second best, and quintile five is the worst. Again, um, the outcome was quite similar. Generally, shares which have done very poorly over the preceding five years continue to do poorly. They generally, those are probably the shares that the analysts get right as well. They're just not good shares. They generally got poor returns on capital um, and badly managed, et cetera, et cetera. So generally, you don't want to invest in shares which have done very poorly over the past five years. But you do want to invest in shares which have done marginally just marginally below average. Quintile 4 far outperformed, so quintile, quintile 3 would be your average. Um, they came in second place, and quintile 4, which would be marginally below average, came in in first place by quite some distance, which probably tells you that at the point in time when you invested in them, they were completely undervalued. They'd lost uh, favor in the market. They'd become unpopular, and generally their share prices would be significantly below what they ought to have been if the market had taken a, a more longer term through the cycle view as to their abilities. So, lesson, don't just invest in shares because they've performed well over the past five years. What you can, however, do is invest in companies which are able to generate high returns on capital on a sustainable basis at a point in time when they're trading on relatively attractive valuations, probably because something's gone wrong. Generally, there might have been a managerial own goal, as they say, or they might, the industry might be a little bit competitive for, for a period in time. You know, cycles persist because people chase, um, chase the best return. So in industries which do suffer cyclicality, maybe like the, the um, consumers, consumer environments, the retailers, generally when interest rates rise, you get to pick up these companies like Mr. Price at, at P multiples of let's say, low double digits, 12, 10, and when the interest rates come down and the cycle improves for them, they sell at 30 times earnings or 25 times earnings, and that really gives you the big um, push from a, from a share price perspective, the big uplift. Yeah, the test um, backed our theory that you want to invest in high return companies at low valuations because quintile one and quintile two, the best two quintiles came first and second. And quintile five, so companies which generate poor returns on capital but trade on high valuations, came stone last again um, and didn't do very well on a relative basis at all. So the key takeaway here is back companies which consistently deliver strong returns on capital um, and do so at a point in time when they're a little bit out of um, favor with the market and hence demonstrate decent valuations. I'm very quickly going to touch on um, some examples um, just to illustrate the points. Sunlum um, is now regarded very highly because it's generated fantastic returns for shareholders. But there was a very long point in time, call it eight years, where it underperformed the market by 50%. And there were very well documented and believable reasons as to why this company should continue to outperform. And some of those at the point in time was that as an asset management business, which is part of Sunlam, hence where I sit, um, the independent asset managers were taking all the money away from the traditional asset managers. Um, there was reput re reputational issues and court cases. There was the impact of AIDS, where everyone believed that um, a great portion of the population would um, die young and hence have an impact on the profitability of a life insurer, et cetera, et cetera. It reached a point in 2008 when it was just way too cheap. Fast forward in the next six years, and the share price outperforms by more than 100%, almost um, almost 200%. Uh, the starting point was too cheap. Um, I'm not going to comment on, on the point there. But the story has changed significantly. All of a sudden, everyone sees the emerging market opportunities, which was there in the past. People just didn't choose to focus on it. Um, ARVs has changed the game, so that was a, a, a difference, uh, which certainly has benefited the company. And then there was also a shift to asset-like businesses, which has improved the returns, um, which is essentially a managerial heads up, because um, that's always what you want to try and do in terms of management. You want to 
improve the sustained um, return on capital of your business, S sustainable return on capital. SAB, um, very much in the news now, so probably a, a one which is topical. Between the years of 96 and 2003, SAB performed very poorly on a relative basis. It underperformed the market by, by 50%. Um, it was the same company in essence, so well, it has changed as times have changed and it's been quite acquisitive, but fundamentally it wasn't doing anything really different. Um, the, the themes were just different at, the, at, the, at, at those points in time. Um, it was seen as an as a old world company. It didn't demonstrate fantastic growth at a point in time when growth was um, quite strong. It was a, the, the SA market was mature and quite competitive with new entrants, etc., etc. Now you can see there's been a significant value um, um, appreciation and relative value gain um, by SAB relative to the all share index. All of these red lines are, are, are relative lines, so they measure the return on a relative basis relative to the all share index. The outperformance again, we're speaking um, 150%. And the story has completely changed. And as of very late, we've had the ABI and our Bush Imbev um, attempted buy, which is still ongoing and imminent um, and has pushed the share price up another 20%. So looking at poor quality companies, and I'm be, going to be very brief on them because we are squeezed for, for time. Um, Anglos, everyone loves to hate Anglos at the moment because it has been a particularly poor company. But for 30 years, Anglos was a fantastic company. Far outperformed the All Share Index and, um, and did so because it did well. But it hasn't been good since then. It's underperformed by a tremendous amount. Um, and just keep in mind how the themes change. Without the com companies fundamentally changing, the themes change. What the market likes to look at changes. And this is what we always got to be careful for when you're investing, not to get caught up in the theme and get caught up at the, at the wrong, wrong place at the wrong time. True as people say, well, you know, of late they're saying, well, is this really a good company? You know, credit cycle, consumers' difficulties. History tells us that it's been a fantastic company, far outperformed the All Share Index, um, the red line that, that is, over a sustained period of time. And just for interest sakes, today went up 10% on the back of a good um, announcement uh, in terms of the, the trading environment. It's one of our biggest bets in our portfolio as well. That's why it was in, in this presentation. Moving on to cyclical companies. No one wants to touch construction at the moment because of what's happened in the preceding probably five years or a little bit longer now. But Wilson Bailey has been an absolutely fantastic company to hold if you held it for a very long time. Um, you know, those, those numbers are, are something to behold. 0.2 to, let's say, so 10 times outperformance over that measurement period uh, being 20 years. So we know the All Share Index has given you a fantastic return over 20 years, something in the vicinity of 18% compounded. This has given you double. Uh, so a really, really good um, company to hold. Moving on to our philosophy, um, I've spoken to why you should be taking a value approach when you value companies. I've spoken to why you have to take a longer term view when you do uh, encompass and, uh, and uh, employ a value philosophy. Now I speak to our philosophy. And quite simply, we describe it as the three P's. Firstly, price, which is a reference to, to value. Um, Pattern, which is a reference to cycles. We say cycles exist and you have to be cognizant of that. And then perspective, and that's what we spoke to earlier. That's the whole normalized earnings uh, ability of a company or any asset and how a company compares to that. When we calculate our normalized earnings, we apply what we call a justified valuation to it, which essentially means we apply a valuation based on the company's future ability to generate earnings growth. And obviously, we, will, we reward those companies which in the future can grow their earnings at a faster rate than companies who in the future can't grow their earnings um, at, a, at a faster rate. So that's what we do. I tell you in this graph why you shouldn't be too reliant on forecasts and why forecasting is extremely difficult. The graph, and let's just focus on the blue line because the blue line is the all share index and the other lines are just the subsectors of the all share index. The graph 
tells you the actual earnings relative to the earnings expectations three years back. So in 2007, 2008, the actual earnings for the all share on aggregate were, were 40 to 50 to 60 percent higher than what um, the analysts had expected three years back. And these are trained professionals who, whose job it is to, to um, forecast earnings going forward. Um, the same can be said in difficult times. Moving on to 2011, and earnings for the all share index were 40% lower than what analysts had expected three years before, which was probably at the top of the boom, the top of the um, economic cycle when things were really going along well. Um, interesting to see, and it's probably very well understood, that the green line, in this case is resources, is by far the most cyclical and very difficult to get right. And the most stable is the red line, which is the industrial companies. A lot easier to be, at least within a ballpark figure, when estimating future earnings. I did speak to um, cycles and, and, and what the market does with cycles. Um, just to just to recap, markets generally dislike shares at the bottom of the cycle and like shares at the top of the cycle. Um, whilst we understand that and we understand that theoretically and ideally we'd like to invest um, at the bottom of the cycle knowing that the market's going to hate a share there and love a share there, what we also understand is that cycles are not exactly repeating and you can't just um, think that because a cycle touches whatever measure you look to, 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 to um, determine the bottom, that it's going to stop there. Um, case in point at the moment is construction. People completely underestimated the depth of this downturn um, and have been significantly hurt by the share price uh, depreciation of those shares. So what we do is we value the company at its normal earnings level, as I've alluded to many times in this presentation, and base our decisions on that normal earnings level. Um, and in so doing, with the comfort of having the ability to hold for a long period of time and the comfort that uh, that comes with the knowledge of knowing that cycles, um, cycles turn, that in time the share will appreciate back to those levels and the, 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 the share price will follow suit. So just to conclude and then touch on our performance. We say that there's a disconnect between short-term, uh, between pricing based, uh, based on short-term prospects and value based on the long-term earnings potential, the long-term cash flows of a company, and hence one has to follow the value philosophy if, if you are serious about generating long-term sustainable returns for your clients. As I've, I think, hopefully demonstrated, um, value investing is theoretically sound it's proven statistically and anecdotally to have worked, um, but does require time and patience. And now is probably one of those points in time where those people who have invested with value investors have to um, fuss bait, as they say, because um, times haven't been as good as what historically they have been. I've spoken to how we normalize and, and how this allows us to get a better view of what the true value of a company is and hence get a better view of when to invest. And another and second last point, very important point, is that when a company trades on expensive valuations, what it says is that the assumptions that the market makes are high. That's why it trades on those expectations. The market is assuming good returns or high levels, higher levels of profitability, strong growth, etc., etc., from the company. Generally, it's hard to live up to high expectations. You know, they say the secret of life is low expectations. Well, the same is true for, for low, uh, lowly valued companies. They got very low expectations priced in. Um, so we generally stick clear of the companies demonstrating high, high expensive value and stick with those which are lesser loved. And um, it's, it's, it's done us well. So we will endeavor to deliver long-term outperformance um, by actively managing portfolios um, and exploiting short-term opportunities or opportunities brought on by short-term short-termism. And then lastly, just on our performance, had to put it up, 
um, by and large over and, and this our equity portfolio is our flagship equity portfolio and I think about 80% of the money we manage follows that mandate and that has generally delivered well those annualized returns um, the balanced portfolios have done even better less money follows them so it's less important from at least a, a client perspective um, but nevertheless, strong relative performances. It must be mentioned, these are pre-costs performances. Um, they're pre-costs because obviously we are a private client business and every client's costs differ, depending on when they came in, depending how what their portfolio looks like, or depending on many reasons, um, their costs differ. The average cost of our clients over many years has been just over 1%, I think it's 1.03%. So if you want to get a fair reflection of a performance relative to the all share index, which is also pre-costs, remember, uh, you can subtract 1% 1, 1 from our performance. <clears throat> if you subtract 1% from our performance when measured on a 10-year view, we'll rank in third place at the moment rel relative to the, the other players in the general equity unit trust. So by and large, We've backed this strategy, and by and large, it's worked quite nicely for us, and we're happy to to stick with it. Um, so thank you. That's my presentation. I've just got some nice quotes. I think there are two elements to that. Firstly, the guys who are taking stick at the moment are the real strict proponents of um, of value investing. They 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 don't necessarily in our mind, have enough perspective as to what the normal earning stream is. I mean, we looked at the most successful asset managers in this country, and generally speaking, the companies that have done well over a 10-year view are still doing quite well. Those which have employed a very strict criteria of value have been hurt because they looked at PEs, for example, of resources companies and saw that they were low, but didn't quite appreciate how much the earnings could collapse. Um, so the perceived value was there, but it didn't actually realize. R remember, yeah, let's, again, it relates to what I just said. They obviously have the estimation of what they believe SAB Miller to be worth. And, you know, they profess to follow a value approach when they, when they make decisions. So they would say SAB Miller is a good investment relative to the other alternatives out there. So I don't know because I don't come from that company, but I'm just hypothesizing as to what they're thinking might be. They might say, they might have had quite a dim view on South African companies and said, well, the economic prospects are not great. Hence, companies who have invested or are heavily um, operational in South Africa won't grow well. And hence, on a five-year view, SAB might ex be expensive now, but on a five-year view, doesn't look so expensive. And hence, it demonstrates value on a relative basis. Because asset management is always a relative game. You've got a certain amount of... Um, you've got a certain universe, a certain amount of constituents or shares in that universe if you've got an equity mandate, and you've got to play the relative game within those shares. I, I tried to answer that in the first question. I think they were a bit dogmatic on their value. They didn't incorporate enough what we call perspective, enough... I, you know, I don't want to say they didn't have enough insights, because they obviously did a lot of work. It's a very thoroughly researched investment house and, and they're generally held in quite high regard um, in the industry. They just haven't been been able to put it all together. Um, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, they were way too heavy in resources and the like. So yes, those guys have been hurt. And as I said, um, we take a little bit of a different view in that we say we've got a value bias but we certainly don't want to bet against a cycle. That's why we spoke about um, pattern. I alluded to pattern when I touched on to pattern, which is essentially alluding to the cycle. You generally don't want to be invested in the down cycle. The markets don't like that, generally speaking. And then that's the whole perspective thing. What's, its, what's the shares through the cycle value? I think, obviously, if, if, if um, RECM would have it again, they would have definitely sat on the sidelines for a bit longer. <laughs>